All right. Well, you want to start? Yeah. Well, we can start with a a couple of topics came up. We could start with COVID things, though, since yes. that's top of mind. Give me your COVID whatevers. Well, I've had some conversations with friends recently that made me realize. I mean, I think I understood to some degree how much the public health messaging is being, like, lost or how the signals aren't clear to people. Um, but I had a conversation with a couple of friends that made me realize just how jumbled the message is. Or not, I won't say the the message necessarily but like the reception of the message is just there's a lot of uh, static in that channel at this point did you have an example that you wanted to give or well yeah i mean so i'm dealing with california went back into like quote unquote lockdown i mean it's like a stay-at-home order um that is technically well i'm not sure i think it's the I believe that the outbreak is as bad as it's ever been here right now. Um, and the lockdown order, the stay-at-home order is, like, pretty broad. But there's some internal inconsistencies in it that are just, like, laughable at this point. Yeah. Um, and, like, that just makes it, like, you feel so worn down by that. By By the inconsistencies? Yeah. And so, like... For example, you're not allowed to, like, go outside with anyone outside your household. So you can't meet up with a friend at the park. You know, even if you're masked and six feet apart, you can't go on a walk with a friend. Like, you're really not supposed to be out with anyone. Right. But they still are allowing outdoor fitness classes with up to 12 people. Uh Uh-huh. And there's still retail still open at 20% capacity with, like, effective metering and, you know. I think, I guess I'm not sure how many of the restrictions for like, you have to use hand sanitizer or anything, but like people are obviously being like very careful. I mean, in the Bay Area, that's a given, but it's just like, it's so, to me, it's so hard to take the rules seriously when, like I could literally just pay for a fitness class with my friends and like visit with them during the fitness class and that would be quote unquote allowed. True. But yes. us going on a walk together, like there's literally no difference in the risk there. Um, if anything, I think it's less risk to be on a walk, like yeah, versus in place. Yeah. Here, I got, here's a question for you because this is a topic that I think is interesting. Um, what do you propose? What would have been better? I think in terms of policy wise. Well, I mean, I'm no expert. First, but... what? <laughs> <laughs> Touche. I'm, I'm ending this conversation right, yeah. away, right now. <laughs> Forget let's, it. It's cancel not the podcast yeah. going forward. But um, I mean, obviously, I feel like it's obvious. Like the reason why they're allowing stores open and fitness classes is because people are like really struggling to get by at this point. Sure. It's been however many. And like gyms especially, you know, so it's like they want to keep the economy like limping along. Um and so, obviously, like, better federal aid would, would like, mitigate that. Like, if you paid restaurants to close, you paid gyms to close, you make sure that those people aren't going to lose their business at the end of this, then then it would be like, okay, let's do what's best for public health. All these places will stay closed. Those people won't be putting political pressure on us. So, like, a, like a, like a uniform policy, right? Yeah. That's, mm-hmm. like, no exceptions. Everyone stays at home. Yeah, like that I was would be talking better. about this with yeah. For me, I would rather know that everyone's following the same rules; they're consistently enforced, and so you don't get the feeling of like I'm a chump for following these. You know, right, right. Where I'm getting really burned out is like the rules. If you are like someone who lives alone and you aren't doing fitness classes, and you know, it's like. You really you're being asked a lot compared to people who live with their family. And I know that there's like obviously other issue, you know, like living with a family comes with its own set of stresses and people with young kids. I feel like, oh, my God, like, I don't even know. Yeah. But I think we're getting now we're getting a hint of like why there's all these exceptions. Right. I mean, you you just described like three reasons. Right. Wait, what are the reasons? Well, like. You know, you know, there's like, you know, living with your family isn't always like <laughs> so simple, yeah. right? Um, and 
it's like but then what's the exception like what do you mean except like well letting people go out is the exception right for certain certain reasons Letting them partake in capitalism, but not go on a walk with friends, I would say doesn't benefit them any better than like. <laughs> like right. But once you. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, I, I don't disagree, but it's like I, I think the problem is that like having a uniform policy is easier is probably easier for us. Right. When you say us, like you mean Roger and Hillary. Like me and you. Yes. Why? Because we could deal with it. You know, it's like. Can we? I don't. <laughs> well, you just said it would be easier if there are no exceptions, right? Oh yeah, yeah. No, but I mean, I guess what I meant was emotionally easier. Yeah, well, because there's no decisions to be made, right? And there's also no, there's no sense exactly. that like other people are doing anything different, right? Yeah, like I was just walking by the park, uh, and there was like three people having lunch, and I was like, even though I'm like outdoors is fine, whatever. I was like, you know, actually. I figured what everyone would follow was not eating outside because, like, I can see how, even in a world where ventilation is key, like, I can see how eating might be higher risk, even if it's outdoors. I mean, I we obviously, there's no way there's a huge amount of evidence giving the longevity of the disease. But anyway, it was somewhere where I had drawn a line. And so to see people doing that, like, I wanted to go up and be like, do you guys know this isn't allowed? Like, like, why are you doing this? And I'm just like, oh my gosh, I'm so angry right now. You know, like that's not like an appropriate. Yeah. I mean, who knows if it's, I don't like that that amount of anger got stirred by seeing three people like having lunch together, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, that's not the person I strive to be. <laughs> and so it just was like, and then I, well, I guess to my original point, the message is so muddled. So one, there's like the rules that are just, like even at first glance are wildly inconsistent. And then on top of that, um, the, I mean, the other point I wanted to make was like, I was talking with my friends who aren't, you know, public health people, they're data people. And like, they literally just like, don't know what to do. And like someone was mentioning like, essentially like kind of the big indoor family get togethers that, I thought were like super clear to everyone. Those were the problem where it's like, oh, you have a like uh, extended family isn't even right. But just like, oh, brothers and sisters who have their own families, like those people get together. They, you know, they feel like they're close. They get they go inside. They have dinner, whatever. I thought that it was clear that those were causing the um, this like second wave. Um, But like this person genuinely had no clue. And I could tell like didn't trust me. And so and then talking with the other friend, it's like, yeah, I don't think that that I, I I trust. I guess I'm listening to you on this. So it's like it just seems like the signal. Like I said, there's so much static at this point that people genuinely don't know what's up anymore. I don't know. I feel like the problem is there's no signal, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I thought there was a signal. I don't know. I thought epidemi- from where from where? Where is it coming from? Yeah, it's just from like epidemiologists I know. Like, yeah, that's not a signal. That's just like your social network, right? <laughs> yeah, but it's not. I mean, no, there are people who are like on TV and, you know, like I feel like I heard consistently from. Yeah, but that's not like, you know, I feel like we've seen this not just with the COVID, right? Really. Like for the last four years, we've seen this with every major issue that has come up, which is that there's like no leadership at the top, right? For some, you know, which and some issues need this, especially like a pandemic, they need like very high level leadership right yeah and so the mm-hmm. people at the lower you know in the states and lower than that are just like it's like fend for yourselves right and so like everyone's got every state has a different message every county within each state has a different message every city within each county has a different message and it's like well <laughs> yeah. and now we go on and we will go on the internet where we have access to like messaging from all over the country and it's like there's 45 messages going on right <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, you're totally right. <laughs> it's just, it all just trickles down, right? And it's like there's no policy at all at the federal level. There's no economic. There's no public health. There's no you know nothing like so. It's like nothing to guide anything at the state or the local level, right? And so it's just like fend for yourselves and figure out what's best. So now you have like every interest available, whether it's economic or social, or whatever you know, fighting for whatever it is they think is they need. Yeah, and, and yeah. It's like <laughs> it's such a meltdown. And there's no rationale to balance any of these interests, you know. And it's like it's just a total collapse of just you know. It is. It's like 
it's a it's a catastrophe that I think is almost impossible to wrap your head around. You know, like when you look at how our country is doing versus others. Yeah. It's it's just like you can't the numbers are so big that you can't even like absorb them, you know. And like if your personal bubble hasn't been impacted with like disease and death, <laughs> then there's like a numbness you have at this point, you know. Yeah. And like and even apparently some people who do like you know like North Dakota like there was that nurse who was saying that even as people were like laying there dying they're like this isn't covid. Yeah. So I heard about that. It's just it's just like ugh it really I don't know. anyway. You almost sounded mad which is unique on this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess I'm not I'm mad too. <laughs> I mean even in Maryland it's like the governor is like is was like you know Basically, the governor's like the states could, the cities could do whatever they want. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like the governor's like restaurants are free to do whatever they want, and then the city's like, no, restaurants have to close by this time. You know, it's like it's just chaos. You know, it's just that's what happened actually here too. The governor came out and was like, here's the criteria: like you have to be at fifteen percent, like open capacity, or like like eighty five percent max staff. Uh, the hospitals have to have fifteen percent of their beds empty. And then you go into like the stay at home order. But then San Francisco was like, we're going to do it early. <laughs> and it was just like, what? Like, I was like all prepped for it. Like I had scheduled a haircut. Like I was like prepping my life for stay at home. Right. And then it went early, you know, and I was just like, <laughs> and then it's like, well, OK, I can see how maybe rural hospitals would need to like ship their people to the city. But then just just say that like, but I don't know. They can't like. Someone said, I mean, I feel like there's probably so many epidemiologists list, or maybe not. I don't know how much we penetrate that market. But, uh. <laughs> <laughs> we got to work. We got to work on our sales channel there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my friend was saying, I don't know if this is true, but my friend was saying that at one point, because the mask. So I've been, I read um, Zainab Tufeki, uh, who's like an academic who usually is doing kind of social media criticism type stuff and like has studied the Arab Spring and she's Turkish and then um but then she's been focused on COVID and has been really good like like shockingly good for a non-epidemiologist I think of like distilling down like and you know in July she was like we're not talking enough about ventilation like this is the key thing and I feel like everyone's kind of come around to that um and she was talking about masks she was talking about outdoors like she just kind of knew what was happening and so she was hypercritical of the mask messaging in the early days because she was like, just tell people that, yeah, they matter, but like we have a shortage. So like do your part as like a sit, like, you know, have your little victory garden, like, <laughs> like do what you can to help the nation versus being like, no, they don't matter. Like only for healthcare workers. Because then people can like smell through that and then they went out and hoarded. Right. Versus if you like, and then apparently Fauci kind of like at one point in an interview was kind of like, oh, yeah, well, we said that because like we didn't run a run out. Like just kind of like, oh, of course we did that. And yeah. it was like, oh, okay. what? Like, no, like you can't just lie. I'm like, I'm realizing how much I'm into like, don't lie to people. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like that's not an effective public health. Principle number one, right? Yeah. Like you can't. Yeah. Is nuance hard? Yes. But like. I don't know. Like, people are probably, I, I guess I kind of assume people are smarter than you think. Or, like, you'll get, if there's one thing about America, there's, like, kind of the individualism. Like, if there's a hole in the argument, it seems like you're going to get, like, people pointing that out and being like, well, I'm not going to follow this rule because it doesn't make sense, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Although maybe that's just me because that's how I feel right now. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. like, it's funny because I was like, oh, should I say this on the podcast? Because like, I'm still going to like do my best to follow the rules. But I don't know. I just I guess like I wanted people to know they weren't alone if they're just like massively burned out. Well, I, you know, I think the truth is like any policy or law is like this, right? Like it's just this is worse, obviously, because it's like people are literally dying. But like any even the most innocuous policy, like has edge cases that has to be dealt with right and like that's why these laws are so damn complicated right because it's like <laughs> you're dealing with an entire population here right and so and 
it's so this one is just as complicated, but it's like the the consequences are more deadly. Is this so? Well, yeah, and the uh, like with the law for better or worse, there's like enforcement. You know, <laughs> it's like well, it, uneven though, maybe you know. Yeah, it is uneven. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's just like we've accepted the unevenness of the application of law. This is like a brand new thing, so it's all like yeah. I mean, just think about tax law. Like, how much of that is enforced, right? I mean, yeah, right. <laughs> I know. So it's I'm just and then take that. I don't and, know why that just makes me think of Trump being like, well, if you're smart, you don't pay taxes. <laughs> <laughs> did he say that? He did. It was like during one of the debates or something. Yeah. He was just like, well, of course I was like trying to minimize it. I'm smart. Like he. He consistently says things that make it really clear that he thinks that being smart is like subverting the law. Right. Well, and like, and yeah. like doesn't comprehend or like, I, who knows, but like, like it, it explains his comment at like the grave of that person, that soldier, like someone's son. He was like there on Veterans Day with like, and like he was like, I don't get it. What was in it for him? Because it's just like, you're a sucker for, yeah. Like, That's a perfect encapsulation of his mindset, I think. Yeah. It's just like, genuinely doesn't get it. Like, yeah. Like it's, there's either something in it for me or it, or there's, or that's it. There's no other, there's no other thing. Yeah. And like, you would be dumb to do something like, like that. And I don't get it. You seem smart. He was probably smart. So like, I don't, this doesn't add up. Like, <laughs> <laughs> But anyway. All right. Um, let's moving on to the next topic. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know. I guess I don't know if there's a wrap up there except for I feel for the epidemiologists. Like I seriously do. Because it's got to be however frustrating it is for us. Imagine how frustrating it is if like your dissertation was like public messaging <laughs> during a pandemic. And like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was reading that New York Times article about like how our uh epidemiologists like dealing right now like, oh what yeah okay. and one of the last things was like how do you think like things will get better or how do you see what you're life changing for the pot are there things that you're gonna like hold on to from this era and the last one was like at least i never have to explain what an epidemiologist is again <laughs> <laughs> i don't know why i found that so funny i, I it is funny with that yeah <laughs> it's a biostatistician it's like the eyes glaze over that's a <laughs> that's a um what do you what do you call that it's called cold comfort right that's a yeah <laughs> you have to have a global pandemic to explain what your job was yeah it's like <laughs> what would be the statistical equivalent of that i don't know i mean i feel like to some degree the the election like, election yeah exactly yeah. like polling and but that's kind of like only nerds partake in that to some yeah degree. i can't think of like well i don't maybe i don't want to think about <laughs> like what would be a global event where like statisticians would be constantly at the forefront well i mean i think it's kind of happening now with like algorithms like facebook newsfeed you know like those things are yeah entering. that's a good point like people there's a cat like i'd say the average non-technical person like will make jokes about like oh like the the algorithm did this or you know like there's a there's more of an understanding of how those function in a product sense. Yeah. I yeah, I mean that's okay. It's not like it's not quite as acute, I think, as um as like a global pandemic. <laughs> mm -hmm. right, but right, uh, right. but it is along those lines, I think. Uh, and it, and I think yeah. it's it's more like I think there's probably more to come, so maybe we haven't seen, you know. Well, and I think though that that conversation is just amplifying with like the election stuff, you know, like I I think I mean, I, I say it's not as cute, but it's also not so diffuse. Like, I think there's, like, certain uh, events that this issue crystallizes around. Yes, that's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, the Facebook, oh, like, our experiment to make people happier or not. Like. Yeah. Yeah. Emotional, emotional contagion, emotion contagion. I can't remember yeah. what they called it. Yeah. It's like an endemic issue as opposed to an epidemic issue. Yeah, I think. that's a good way of putting uh, it. Like it kind of ebbs and flows, but it's always there. Um, yeah. It's also only one type of uh, statistics, obviously. Yeah. Like, I mean, climate change is the other one where it's like. I don't think statisticians are like at the forefront of that, though. No. Yeah. I agree. I mean, it's arguable that's 
I mean, I don't know if statisticians would ever be at the forefront of anything. <laughs> but um, I mean, it would require us to like, you know, to to do that, right? But the only the only other thing that's popping to mind is there was the um the breast cancer the like should you take estrogen after menopause study? Yes, um, yes. Where it was like for for a long time, a lot of people took estrogen. The hormone replacement therapy. Yeah. yeah, hormone replacement therapy after menopause. And then it turned out it was like a confounding issue in the study. And it actually was like increasing your chance of breast cancer. It, well, I think it increased your... Wait, hold on a second. It increased your chance of like cardiovascular problems, like heart attacks, I think. Oh, really? I really thought it was breast cancer. I don't think... No, you might be thinking of mammography. No, definitely not. I don't think it was breast. Well, maybe it was. I don't know. I can't remember that. Yeah. It was the Women's Health Initiative study. Yeah. Yeah. So that was like an issue where it really came down to like statistics, like a different statistical analysis impacted people's lives in a way that probably irritated them. But I, I think comparing almost any event to this to COVID is like not fair, really. Oh, for like... sure. Yeah. No, like <laughs> people's <laughs> lives are permanently changed. I would say every person's life yeah. how the yeah how the profession is highlighted it's like yeah you know <laughs> yeah it's like these obscure people became like the national heroes i mean i think like in the economic crisis in like 2008 right like economists were like everywhere right it's like yeah this is the a disaster for economists right well, yeah like everyone knows like subprime mortgages or right yeah yeah so i yeah, this, what's the it, we, maybe we can ask or what's the statistical disaster that would <laughs> call, make us co- you know come to the fore? I don't know what that would be. It ha- it's it seems like there won't be one. I, <laughs> I would love to know. I've said I've I've uh, said my my hypotheses. Yeah. Wow, that's some like dark thinking there. Okay, so uh... <laughs> <laughs> I know this is a. Like, I was saying. Like, it's funny. I feel like, you know, when you have a friend who comes late to a like get together and then you have to catch them up. Yeah. I feel like I'm doing that with the listeners where I'm like, I was telling Roger earlier that I was having a horrible, terrible, terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day. Yeah. <laughs> the irritation is, is high today. So I just want to quickly put one thing out there, uh, which yes. is that uh, so f- on Twitter, Fernando Mateos Gonzalez asked, what was our favorite episode of the podcast so far? So this is episode 121 we're doing right now. Um, so there have been 120 episodes. And uh, the f- you replied that you had some note about episode 38, which I guess yeah. um, I, don't, I didn't look it up. But did you look it up what that episode was? Nope. Okay. I, I, I even had it in my – I literally had the paper because I've been – I mean, this is another potential topic, but I've been implementing getting things. I'm taking some of my unemployment time to try to like really like pick up getting things done again and try to really implement it. So it's right. like hang on. my folder. <laughs> yeah. Hang on there. Don't don't get into that. What's one topic at a time? Well, no, no. OK, I was just trying to give context for like why Got I it. was looking through our transcripts because I had them in a big pile. And so I was creating like an archive system. And I made little folders for the because I I'm keeping the archive the printed archive for now. Um, and so anyway, I was leafing through it trying to put them. I had the folder. I have like episodes one through ten is one folder, and then eleven through twenty. So I was like going through them, and um, I I like picked up this one, and it just had like big one written all over it. And so, and I know that was from me prepping the live episode, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. I have it in front of me. Episode 38 was called Banging on the Piano. Oh, yeah. I remember that. It says, Hillary and Roger revisit the desktop versus cloud discussion. Oh, okay. That's why it's the big one. <laughs> Hillary recaps CSV Conf, and mm. Roger discusses the aesthetics of data analysis. Oh, okay. That was like you prepping for your professor lecture. My dean's lecture, yeah. Dean's lecture, yeah. Okay. That was a pretty good episode, I think. Yeah, you were talking, although we've moved on from that paradigm to some degree. Yes. But that was talking about the, uh, what are the components of a good data analysis? So I just want to, to be honest, I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I have no idea what's my favorite episode, mostly because like, I don't really remember most of them. Uh, and uh, so, and, and like, 
I haven't listened to all of them. It's different when you make them and you listen to them. It's a totally different experience. Totally. Yeah. And so I don't have that perspective. But uh, if anyone out, li- any of the listeners want to want to mention their favorite episode, I we'd be. I think I'd be really happy to hear or be curious to hear oh, for what sure. they were. Yeah. Same. Yeah. I have like I have my favorite insights. Like I still think the insight you had about. Um, data analysis as a type of negotiation or like the when we read getting the yes Mm -hmm. i think that was like probably of the podcast that's the one i'm focused on right now that i think yeah yeah i still i I feel like i'm still working through the implications of that one yeah yeah it's it's a lot (laughs) but um so yeah i feel like i have like oh this kind of narrative of like where we got to in our discussions but I can't line those up with episodes. I mean, that that 100th episode, like, retrospective was my first attempt to do that. And it was pretty, like, labor intensive. I had to go through all the transcripts and, like, figure out what we talked about. Right, right. It was, uh, it was a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so tweet us at NSS Deviations, uh, your favorite episode. The other thing that's weird that I think we've talked about is that Sometimes we'll record an episode where I'm like, man, it's okay. And then people like love it. <laughs> yes. You know, that has happened many times over the course of 120 episodes where I'm like, this episode like barely met my standard for quality. Oh, God. Ouch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. You know, I mean, <laughs> even though I agree, that still stings a little. Well, at least that's like the feeling. That's just like the gut yeah. feeling I have after the episodes. Like, it was fine. We kind of wandered or whatever. Like, who knows? And then you put it, and then it's like, it gets like far and away the best kind of like feedback or engagement that we've had in a while. And it's like, I don't understand the correlation between yeah. what we do and what people like. I just, so, so there's no hope. 100%. Yeah. <laughs> I actually think, you know, now that we're saying that, the election episode is an example of that where, I mean, I think there was just good content for that, <laughs> unlike usual. No, just kidding. But um, Wait, which election episode? The one where I was going through, like, here's what it was like on election night. Okay. <laughs> we have we have at least two election episodes. <laughs> yeah. This yeah. was the, like, recap yeah. from me that a lot of people, like, I can tell a lot of people listen, like, you know, ex coworkers listening or whatever. Um, and so I think that that one is good in that it's a topic that lots of people are interested in. Yeah. <laughs> Whether or not I was organized in my thinking during it aside, <laughs> I was still like blitzed from. <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, so anyway, so that one's another option. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, I'm glad we both have. Yeah, because sometimes at the end of an episode, I'm just like, God, Roger was awful this time. <laughs> hey, you know, I, I can't I can't be on all the time, you know? <laughs> no, I literally never think that. I always just think, it's always like self-criticism. <laughs> <laughs> like, I wasn't interesting. All right, well. It's always in your head. It's always in your head. Yeah, I think so. Do you want to discuss either any residual thoughts on the election? <sighs> Not really. I mean, I think, I mean, I probably talked about this before, but it really does feel like you're on a sports team. I keep going back to that analogy. Did I talk about that? When I don't we did can't remember. I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, I think like, I was just reflecting again, like contrasting previous professional experiences with this. It's like, in many ways, it really was like the polar opposite where like, like people just were in such a radically different mindset of like we're not building anything long term. Everyone's aligned that like ego is bad. Like you can't you have to be doing what's best for the candidate or for the campaign and you can't be building your own personal projects. And so it's just such a different set of stressors than in like a normal workplace where you have people thinking about like their careers and they want to create projects that will like get them promoted. And, you know, there's like, it's just like you're building relationships. Obviously you're doing the relationship building at least in the campaign, but like it's a, it's a really profoundly different experience. And I really liked it. I don't know. I think it, I think that I like being part of a team a lot, you know, well, can I can I ask you why you say it's like being on a sports team? Because you know, I've never been on a sports team. You haven't ever. 
Well, you've been on more. You've been at it a slightly higher. Like my last sports team, I think might have been in like elementary school. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I I definitely was on it longer, <laughs> and uh, I guess I'm just cooler. That's what it comes down. You've had like your big glasses that wouldn't even close. Like. <laughs> I thought we were going to talk about that on the podcast. <laughs> anyway, I uh, I had sports goggles, so, you know, whatever. I was a nerd, too. But um, there's, like, such an understanding. I mean, I think this is part of why I like sports. There's You get into these, like, I mean, you're, like, simulating war, you know? And you're, like, okay, we have to survive. Like, we have to do the thing on the court. You can't, like, like if your opponent gets to you, then you lose, right? Or, like, if your team breaks down, if you're yelling at each other, then you lose. Like, there's such a – everyone is, like, really trying their hardest to keep cohesive when you're on the court. Uh Uh-huh. And, I mean, obviously there's drama and people get mad at each other. But, like, there's such an understanding of, like, that's when teams fall apart, when they're, like, fighting with each other. They don't come together. And so – it's that same dynamic on the campaign, which is also like semi warlike conditions, right? And so it's just like, you know, everyone's just like, I gotta power through this and, and not like I mean, I think it does get unhealthy, but I'm not saying I like the unhealthiness of it at all. It's just like but I like the fact that people are really pushing themselves to like get along and to do the right thing. Right. Well there's a kind of a a recognition that like <laughs> like i can't get this done by myself right yeah exactly yeah it's like i have to be a team player like that's we won't do it unless that happens and so yeah actually now i'm thinking did you ever finish the last dance oh man it's a sl- it's been a <laughs> it's been a long journey for me i'm a, i'm like t- t- three more episodes to go <laughs> i know it's killing you but I, yeah, it kind of is. Yeah. But it's like, I mean, I was thinking about MJ a lot or like that team. Like there was the. But well, you um, have a lot in common with them, I think. Yeah, especially I mean, with MJ, obviously. Yeah. You know. But it was like there was um, like there was that there was this big episode about the Pistons. Like they were a super rough team against the Bulls. And um there was some episode where, like, when they finally won against the Pistons, and, like, the Pistons, it was, like, at, it's funny because at the time, it was Dennis Rodman, but he was on the Pistons, Pistons at the time. And there was this, like, super flagrant foul against Scottie Pippen where he just, like, they were kind of, like, falling, and then he just, like, shoved him down. Like, he, like, finished it off. And, like, Scotty just, like, stood there. Like, he was on the ground, and he just kind of, like, took a moment, like, kind of staring off into the distance and then just, like, got back up and kept playing. And, like, everyone – and they're interviewing everyone separately, but everyone was, like, and that was the moment when we lost because, like, he didn't react to that level of abuse. Right. And so we knew we couldn't get to him anymore. And so – that is like i guess to me it's like it almost brings in the like the meditation or the zen philosophy of like that is that is like enlightenment or that is like being in the moment you yeah, know like yeah. you're being attacked and you kind of are just like i'm just going to keep doing what i got to do like i'm you know I, and like i mean that's not all that there is obviously but it's just like it's such a it's such a state of being that i aspire to you know mhm I think there's a lot. I mean, I think Phil Jackson on the Bulls, like he was really into mindfulness and yeah, you know, he had lots of different like spirituality things he did. <laughs> yeah, well, there are all kinds of news stories about him and his uh, spirituality. Yeah, well, he was like grew up in what Montana or something. Oh, so that, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was like friends with a lot of like Native Americans and so oh, that's right. Of, yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. He was a lot of like Native American type stuff. You know, they did something where they like. Like you know, burned pieces of paper. Like, like they have like thing. You know, like they did like rituals that were like you know borrowed from different spiritual cultures. So anyway, so yeah, I don't know. I think that appeals to some people and it doesn't to other people. But yeah, yeah, and I mean, it was hard. Like I don't think it's long term sustainable. And I think that I don't think it's good to just like squash your feelings or any. You know, like you have to work through with people. You can't just like. 
be like, I am a machine, nothing matters. Right. <laughs> I just give, I never receive. Like, you know, that doesn't so it's like it's a good it's a you I would call it like a practice opportunity, like in, mm-hmm. in Zen talk of like it's a challenging situation, you get to observe yourself in it and like notice where you're thriving and where you're not and work on the places where you're not. I don't know. <laughs> I mean you kind of went right past this, but you did say that um it was different from any other experience you've had. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. I haven't found that, like, it, you know, at Etsy or Stitch Fix or anywhere else that we were in that type of intense, like, goal-oriented, <laughs> cohesive, frantic march or whatever you would call it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. It's usually it's, – it's more the policy space of, like, competing interests and – trying to make decisions and keep everyone happy and i think in academia i mean for me it's like that's we're in the extreme other end <laughs> oh for sure yeah <laughs> i saw someone tweet about that like someone was talking about like the pressures of academia and he this guy was like i worked as a banker and nothing here has ever come remotely close to like the pressure i felt there <laughs> like you mean nothing here is as close as what it's like to be a banker yeah yeah, yeah. okay I, but I mean, I think obviously that's very self-imposed. Like, I mean, I think that's the thing with academia. It's like you construct the world that feels right to you. And for some people, that's very high pressure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's that's true. And I think um, it takes a while to learn. <laughs> it, it takes like years to learn that it's mostly self-imposed. Um, yeah. Well, I guess that's... That's true everywhere, not just in academia. (laughs) It is true everywhere. Yeah. I mean, I think like probably the threat of like, I mean, yeah, I guess it's like, what is your loss function? Yeah. Yeah. Like the threat of losing your job is much higher in banking. But then that's also like you've put yourself in a position where you have that high pressure job. So I don't know. I take it all back. I think, I think everyone constructs their own reality where the pressure is like, equal roughly what they think they should be <laughs> that's like uh that feels like a um it's like a conservation of something theorem <laughs> conservation of emotional trauma theorem, or something like that yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm just going all zen today like, yeah yeah that's good these are usually our better episodes i'm trying to like yeah. develop predictors of our better episodes here I think, I mean, like, I I know I've said this before and I wrote about it once, but it's like, the reason I'm like, it's all Zen is that that's like the idea if you go to a monastery or do like an intensive training period is that you take away everything, you know, like you don't have anything in your life except for getting up and sitting and like some sort of job that's like in the kitchen cooking dinner, you know, like it's something that's like, quote unquote, inconsequential. Yeah. And you essentially like. I think I mean I've never done it but my understanding from the people who have is that you end up kind of constructing like you'll you'll make up stories in your head about how like this person's really mad at you and they're acting like a total jerk and like they don't understand even though the person like you literally aren't talking <laughs> like it's like oh they walk by me too fast like that person's such a jerk like yeah they probably are thinking I'm a horrible person you know and like then you're kind of like oh wait I kind of made all this up like and the whole your whole life is like that turns out um all right any other i have one more thing i want to talk about which uh i feel like you didn't like respond with like the level of like like wow <laughs> R- wait respond to what <laughs> to that like extreme zen moment you're just like all right yeah that's true <laughs> we all make up horrible situations for ourselves well I, maybe it's because like we've had this conversation before Okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> I've already accepted that truth. Yeah. What's the horrible thing you have created for yourself? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> I need to reflect more on that myself, to be honest. I know. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard. I have a, I have my, my cat is like very demanding, and that's definitely something I've created for myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure someone else could like have better rules with their cat and then (laughs) the cat wouldn't be as demanding. Yeah, but it's furry and adorable though. I know. My cat's like, I think if I meow 
at this tone in this way, she'll actually give me more food. So I'm going to do that. <laughs> um, okay. Now I'm now I feel bad for not, um, acknowledging your, uh, insight. Oh, no, don't, don't okay. actually feel bad. All right. I won't. <laughs> that was like a Hillary ego moment. I had one more thing that I meant to bring up like six episodes ago and I forgot. Um, What's that? So I, I, cause I gave a talk a little while ago. It was like back in November and I was talking about, I, don't know, I was talking about data analysis and um, someone in the audience asked me whether data, like the kind of like technical aspect of data analysis was basically a solved problem and that the only problems that existed were like ones that kind of involved interactions between people. I saw, did you tweet about that or like? I don't think so. <laughs> I feel like I've heard this before. Well, actually, the person who asked me the question referenced something and I can't for the life of me remember what it was. So it wasn't like, so it, clearly the idea is out there. I, I had see. never heard it, uh, but um, yeah. but it's obviously out there somewhere. So maybe that's, mm -hmm. but uh, anyway, I just thought it was an interesting question to discuss. I don't even really understand. It's, it's saying that maybe here's how I would rephrase it: for any given problem that, like scientific or whatever problem that involves data, the the tools for for kind of addressing that problem are most are basically there, right? The the data the, the statistical tools um, are basically there. I mean, yeah, maybe not optimal, not, maybe not the most efficient or whatever, but like we have the tools available. So. If an analysis fails in any way, right, it's because of some sort of like social interaction. I disagree. Disagree. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that the imperfection of the measurement tools is what I'm thinking about. Yeah. I think there's a little bit of fuzziness and kind of like what's technical and what's like social, you know? Yeah, but like if you have a instrument that isn't performing as expected. Well, then you might ask, well, why isn't it performing as expected? But there could be, I wouldn't call it social interaction. Like there could just have been some sort of undiscovered property of like the way light waves interact in this system. That is true. Like there could just yeah. be like a physical unknown, like an unknown unknown, right? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that yeah. that like could not have that wasn't anticipated in the design process, right? Right. Yeah. There's also just literal. I mean, like hypothesis testing. Like you will detect the wrong, you will make the wrong call five percent of the time if the null is true. That's just like known. That's not. I wouldn't say that's a failure of data analysis, though. That's like a, you know, like you wouldn't do anything different in the data analysis than that, even if the decision that's made is incorrect, right? But then what is the failure? Well, good question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because like, how would you differentiate that from like, it seems, it seems too simple. I guess my like, well, what about this? What about that? It just seems too simplistic. It, to me, it feels too open-ended. Um, yeah. Like it's, it, which I think is another way of saying it's, it's too simple, right? It's too easy an explanation um, because like, Obviously, like everything in data analysis involves like humans, right? Because like we're the ones doing the analysis, right? And so you could always kind of trace something back to like a human interaction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like the whole world is like the natural, like anything except for the natural world is like ultimately humans. Sure. Exactly. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> so, like it's, I don't know, it's saying that. Like, it's well, I guess maybe another way to say it is it's kind of like a vacuous statement. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's a statement that might sound like, it, it, like, yeah, it's, it's it's like it sounds right until you think about it for as long as we've thought about it. So, like, I don't know, which by minutes. my clock is about five minutes. Yeah, <laughs> two yeah. minutes actually. Yeah, you're <laughs> two right. to five. Yeah, <laughs> you're setting it up for a fair amount. I thought time. this could be like a twenty minute segment. Um, yeah, I mean, I think. Well, I, but that said. <laughs> We, I think we do, um, we downplay the role of like human interaction, I think, in data analysis. I think, I think <laughs> this is like another, now I'm just thinking about The Last Dance again, where Michael Jordan, you haven't seen this part. Oh my God. He gives this amazing monologue. I mean, you really need to get through, I think it's episode eight. Okay. That's my, that's, that's what I'm, that's up next in the queue. I'm going to watch it tonight. You have to watch it. That's my favorite. And then there's just this moment where he like, 
he like it's like the bet I have a screenshot of it because he like points both the fingers at the camera and he goes, "Well, that's you because you've never won anything," and like that's how I feel like like people don't talk about interaction. I'm like, "Well, that's you." <laughs> <laughs> Back to like Hillary's ego being like Michael Jordan. <laughs> I agree that other people have that problem. That's what I meant. I would never. I mean, obviously, you, you don't have any problems. It's such a good moment. Oh my god, you have to watch it. Like, text me immediately once you're done. Should we just stop recording? Maybe should we just? Yeah, uh... we should stop. We should pick it up. I've actually listened to podcasts where they do that. They like stop and then they're like, okay, okay, okay. We like did the thing and then. <laughs> no, I can't. I can't. I can't like pick up this recording and like an hour later and then. That's that's okay. It's yeah. not in my. I don't have it in my schedule. I don't have the slack in my schedule. <laughs> so yeah. No, I mean, I, I do. I agree that it is a huge deficit of the field that I mean, I just think I still I think that it is it's the same as the negotiation thing. It's like the people who are drawn to the field are almost by definition people who like didn't become salespeople or, you know, like there's a like they're not poets, you know, necessarily, Um you know, I've, yeah, it's just like Judea Pearl just like popped in my head. Of like, well, he's a poet. Um, anyway, and so there's like, uh, a, you know, like there's a reason, there's a reason why that would be a consistent deficiency because I think the core competency of the job is one that like people who potentially enjoy not interacting with humans might <laughs> gravitate towards. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there you go. So yeah, I agree with like the sentiment of it. I just wouldn't. I would never phrase it that. Like, why have why go all in? Like, why not just be like very frequently human interact? Like human interaction probably impacts impacts data analysis ten times as often as you think it would. You know, like why why not just say that? That yeah. kind of because that kind of statement doesn't get anyone's attention. You know. Yeah, but like I feel like the this is the only unsolved problem of data analysis. Like will only attract well actually like that i feel like that's like <laughs> yeah but that's only... like in our day and age that's what we that's what we call a debate yeah it's like a very you'll get high engagement yeah tweet gotta yeah. get those metrics up yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right um that's all i have on my list Do you, oh you ha- oh getting things done you're getting things done again I'm taking some of my time off, which is of indeterminate length, uh, and I am trying to kickstart getting things done again, which everyone will remember, of course, that I tried it at one point and then mostly failed, (laughs) or it just kind of like hung, is it sallow? Is that the right? Fallow. Fallow Fallow with an F. Fallow. It it hung fallow uh, for a while, and so now I'm picking it back up, and I'm getting farther this time. Like, I... I have succumbed to the idea that I need a file cabinet. In fact, I bought one a while ago, but then I am now, instead of having papers stacked inside of it, like literally stacked, (laughs) I have now actually created files and I'm like, and it's actually, it's kind of thrilling to be like, I don't know what to do with this piece of paper. Let me make a file. Like now I don't have to decide it's in where it needs to be now. And I'll go back and call it maybe a year later. Like, I'm not trying to put off decisions, but it's just satisfying to be like, even Wait, though no, I no. don't know what to do. <laughs> you but... said it was thrilling. <laughs> no, it is. It's like, well, you know, there's like the label making and like, it's the reason it's thrilling is because like, it's been in a stack for so long where I see it and I'm like, oh, I don't know what to do with this. Like, you know, <laughs> record of Kima's dental visit. Like, <laughs> like and I like maybe I should scan it. Is there is it fair to say that there was a time period recently where things did not get done? Yeah, I think that is aggressively fair. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like I have this like debt of things. There's to get a deficit, done exactly. I'm, yes. Yeah. So I'm like trying, and I, I think it's like I think almost everyone, according to the book, I think that most everyone who starts is like in that place where it's like, oh, I have like 50 things on the back burner that like pop in my head and I'm like, oh, I need to do that. And so it's like, how can you like get a system kick started so that those things aren't on your mind all the time? They're yeah. like either filed appropriately or they're like, y- you've like 
you know, put it in the appropriate folder to remind yourself in a month that you might want to do that next month or, you know, whatever it is. So, yeah. Um, I'm very excited about it. How's it going so far? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I had like one. So he you've already stopped book, doing it. <laughs> I know. He says in the book to like have two to three days of like uninterrupted time. And believe it or not, I actually haven't had that since I like started um, just with like doctor appointments and things like that. And so um, I've like I'm like I got I got like an initial start. And I, I had to, like, buy supply, you know, it's, like, the whole thing. And then, um, so I got an initial start, but then I've been kind of, like, uh, delayed since then, where I have, like, half days, and I'm like, oh, I don't want to, like, start. I think I just need to, like, so anyway, I would say it's going about the same as last time, where there was a lot of initial enthusiasm, <laughs> followed by, like, me being like, I should do that. So we'll see if I can. It is just, like. Being alive is tiring. <laughs> <laughs> like existing as a human, you know what I mean? Like yeah. when you're high energy, it's like, oh yeah, I'm going to do that. And then like you have a day where you're really tired and like you got your eyes dilated at the doctor, <laughs> which is part of my no good, very bad day. Yeah. And like, then you just don't want to do anything. Oh my God. I don't know. Maybe that's just, I know that's not just me, but no. It's not, I think some people, that's not them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, we will expect regular updates. Um, oh, great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> on, on what you've gotten done. That'll, this is good. I'll, I'll... We, will be, we will be your account, accountability group here. <laughs> great. <laughs> just like last time where we just slowly stopped talking about it. Well. <laughs> I mean, we're not very good at it. I'm just saying that yeah. we'll be your <laughs> accountability group. I, I I bet that you one time thought about bringing it up and were like, mm, I'm not going to do that to her. No, you know, that, I don't think that's, I think I just forgot about it. <laughs> well, that's good. And then I was like, good. Phew. <laughs> Does the we'll see. There. Yeah. My energy today is low, but maybe tomorrow it'll be higher. All right. Well, the next episode of Not So Standard Deviations is likely to be our final episode of 2020. I saw. It's like we're set to record two days before Christmas. Oh, is that true? Well, I guess what the hell's the difference? It's not like <laughs> I'm doing anything. <laughs> I know. I thought the same thing. I was like, wait, I'm not traveling. Whatever. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, we can record Christmas Day. No, probably not for you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might have to like cook a dinner or something. I have my scheduled Zoom calls and then, you know. I mean, literally, according to California's, like, lockdown rule, I should not see anyone unless I have, like, like literally, they're, like, don't see people that day because all the stores are closed. And I mean, some stores obviously are open. And, like, there's not going to be fitness classes that day. Right. I, I mean, whatever. Should we plan anything special for the final 2020 episode? Some sort of celebration. <laughs> Although we don't necessarily know that it's going to be better in 2021, but like no, we do probably not. yes. It, yeah. Well, how could it get worse? I guess that's the that's the question. Oh, I mean, I can think of many ways. Okay, let's not worse. talk about them. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> living in denial is the secret to success, I think. Yeah, I think that there are many. I think that like we'll probably regress to the mean. Which, yeah, which is definitely Hopefully. up, right? Although, but there's, it's definitely like auto-correlated. You know what I mean? Like... <laughs> Okay. Anyway. So you think, okay, I mean, what is the lag on the autocorrelation? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, plus that doesn't account for the fact that things will feel better, even though objectively they are way worse than like two years ago on some, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, fair like enough. if restaurants yeah. are at like 25% capacity, everyone's yeah. going to be like, yay. Even yes. though like two years ago, it's like, what? Like, why are restaurants going out of business? So. <laughs> I'm trying to think, what was our first episode of this year? It was January 2nd, and we were talking wow. about R in 10 years. <laughs> that was the topic of the day. That's funny. We were thinking about the future. Yeah. Even then. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll try to think of some uh, celebratory topic for next yeah, time. Yeah. We can do a retrospective on the year. Yeah. Maybe we could do a clips episode. <laughs> <laughs> like us freaking out dave robinson has that like 
he had a really he had a tweet that went viral where he'd like plotted out like how the year felt and it was like half it was like a bar and like half the bar was just march and then there was like april may june july august like we're all stacked on like like super short yeah <laughs> And then there was like the week Trump got COVID was like really long. <laughs> it, was, like, <laughs> yeah. it was so good. It was like, yep, yeah, that's exactly what it felt like. Yeah. Um. So. All right. Was there anything else? Oh, my milk frother. Oh. I don't know if we have. I can't see at what time we're at. One twenty. Oh my god. Oh. You want to save it for next time? Would you have more experience? I'm a. I I could go either way. Let's save it for next time.